I'm happy that I haven't had to say once so far in the festival, you know, it's 1946 or 47, there are no cell phones. They do not exist yet, so I don't want to see any of them in the theater. But you guys have been pretty good. We haven't had to do that yet. Um, okay, we're going to do our, yep, there it is, the shadow play in our city trivia. And may I have on the stage here the fabulous Carly with the magic box. No, no, no. 
control issues there. <laughs> Scott was loaned out to go to RKO for a film, and they were going to have Edith Head do her costumes. And she was like, can't somebody else take a crack at me? Like, why Edith Head again? Um, but actually, Hal Alls insisted, and he had Edith go through the costumes that they had designed for her at RKO. But that story actually has a happy ending. We have to set it up first. This is one of four movies where Liz Scott plays a nightclub singer. That, that's the record we've checked. <laughs> As I, as I always call her, I can't write her name in any article or anything without calling her the throaty thrush, <laughs> Elizabeth Scott. The perfect handle for her. But, of course, as was standard practice at the time in Hollywood, it's not her singing. It's never her singing. This personally devastated me when I found out about this, that, oh, that's not Rita Hayward singing for the title of the that's somebody else. And she is almost always dubbed, and in this case definitely dubbed, by a wonderful singer named Trudy Stevens. Uh, fun fact about her is that it's actually her voice with Big Crosby's on the famous recording of White Christmas. Now, I don't know if it's her constantly being dubbed by somebody else, but Liz Scott actually recorded a record in 1958. The record I have three copies of. Yeah. I, should, I should be raffling off one of those. Right? <laughs> but, but she did, right? Yes. Uh, right, she recorded an album just to prove, I guess, that she actually could sing. Um, and she decided to ask Edith Head to design her dress that she wore on the cover now. <laughs> so she wears this very lovely blue jersey number with a high collar that Edith Head designed. Well, because... It's because of this movie. The dress she's wearing is inspired by the wardrobe from this movie because she said, I didn't feel like a nightclub singer when I came onto the set, but I put on that dress and it gave me the armor to play the role. So there, what more can a costume designer do for you? Yeah. And, and of course, on that album, Liz Scott does a song called I've Got a Deep Dark Secret. In fact, she did have a deep dark <laughs> secret. Uh, and, and my relationship with Liz has always has been interesting. She passed away a few years ago. But when I first started doing this, she did come out uh, to some of the films that we showed that she had started. And I had written about her in my first film art book, and I had, I mean, this is a graceless way of putting it, but I had outed her uh, in the book because the, the legend was that Liz Scott uh, was, you know, she was Hal Wallace's quote unquote protege. Uh, even though he was a married man, everybody in Hollywood knew that Liz Scott was sleeping with Hal Wallace. And just like she got tired of being dressed, I think she just got tired of men in general. <laughs> and um, the stories were that uh, she could be found in all the best lesbian clubs in Hollywood and that Liz had this other life that she chose to live, which she vehemently denied her entire life. And I did not write these things in my book until I had confirmed this with a publicist at Paramount who said, we used to regularly deal with that. Like, like having to actually get Liz out of some spots in Hollywood that she would get herself into. Uh, so I felt like, okay, but this meant that I could never actually associate with Liz when we did these festivals because her people did not want, they did not trust me to not go there with her. So I never actually got to do an onstage interview with her, right? And, and I really think she, you know, she lived a, a long time and, for whatever reason, chose to not enjoy her own renaissance because she did not want to deal with these issues, right? And she, she has a huge fan club now uh, that she never really got to know anything about uh, because she just refused to come out in public and do shows like this because guys like me would ask you questions <laughs> like that. And so um, that, that just never happened. But um, I, I think she was amazed to see uh, that because of film noir and her unique niche in film noir, um, that has, has kept her legacy alive all of these years, which is a very, very cool thing. So, um, and I'm very excited to show this movie tonight. Uh, because this is the only way you can see that this is a brand new digital restoration of the film. Now, normally, you know, I'm a 35 millimeter purist guy, but if the only way you're going to see it 
is if they do a digital restoration, then I am all for it. And uh, our friends in Paramount, specifically Andrea Callis, who was in charge of the archive there, uh, dealt with me for years trying to get them to make a new print of this film. And finally she said, Eddie, we, we, we are scanning the original negative and we're doing a digital restoration of the film, uh, which is kind of just for us. So this is only the second time this has been shown. It looks absolutely sensational, and I am thrilled to present to you tonight Al Wallace's I Walk Alone. <laughs>